In northern New Mexico and southern Colorado, the Cumbres and Toltec Scenic Railroad offers one of the world's greatest train rides featuring spectacular mountain scenery with trains pulled by the very steam locomotives that have run the 64-mile route since the 1920s. Operated from May to October, passengers can see the mountains in spring, summer, autumn, and even winter. At the end of the season in October, the railroad usually has positioning moves, in this case passenger equipment being moved west and freight equipment moving east. The Cumbres and Toltec runs from Chama, New Mexico and Antonito, Colorado at between 8,000 and 10,000 feet in elevation over Cumbres Pass, and by mid-October several feet of snow can be on the ground in various places on the line. And in early December, the railroad operates Santa Claus trains for a couple of weekends where the train and snow and Santa make for a perfect winter holiday setting.
But after Santa leaves on his sleigh, winter finally gets a firm grip on the Cumbres and Toltec, and the snow takes hold on Cumbres Pass. But didn't the line once run all year? How did they do it with the tremendous amount of snow that falls here? It's late February 2020, and the old section house and water standpipe atop Cumbres Pass are half buried in the snow, with almost no trace that there is a railroad here. Further down the line, it's much the same, with the right-of-way buried in the snow and rusty rails crossing Highway 17. In Chama, we find the railroad yard which was once the midway terminal on the narrow gauge line between Alamosa and Durango, Colorado, but is now the western terminal of the Cumbres and Toltec, the track between here and Durango long torn up. But something unusual is going on, because over at the engine terminal, we see locomotives under steam. And sitting next to the coaling tower is the ultimate piece of snow fighting equipment on the railroad, the rotary snowplow. Back when this was a full service freight and passenger line, the Rio Grande Railroad would run special snowplow trains to keep the line open, a process that often took days. In 1991, for our documentary video, Rotary Snowplow Through the Rockies, we interviewed several people with first-hand knowledge of winter on Cumbres Pass and the snowplow trains that kept it open. Eldon Morgan was a locomotive engineer who participated in several rotary runs. Nancy Kingry and Laura Morgan were railroad wives who had often unappreciated roles in the rotary's operation. George Kingry was a conductor on the Rio Grande. And Ken Lively's dad, Charles, was the depot agent at Cumbres and Ken actually grew up living on top of the mountain pass. It was always a lot of work, and it was no eight-hour days in. It's sometimes you would work uh, anywhere from 16 to 20 hours there, and maybe you would tie up and, and get eight hours off and then turn around and go right back. Uh, after they got the outfit cars upgraded and one thing or another to where uh, the crews could stay in it. We had we would work 14 hours off. I mean, 14 hours on, and then we'd have eight hours off. When the phone rang, you knew he had about an hour to an hour and a half, and he had to be there. And so it was rush, rush, rush all the time. And you were you never got to go anywhere because you always had to stay there and wait for the phone to ring, and because you never knew when they were going to call you, so you couldn't even go uptown or do anything because you had to stay right there where the phone was. You didn't go outside and do very much unless one person was always at home to listen to the phone. Usually they called about 2 o'clock in the morning. So you got up and you packed them a lunch. First you had to build a, a fire with a coal and wood to cook them something to eat, get them some breakfast, and uh, pack them a lunch at 2 o'clock in the morning and build your fire. And by the time they got gone, you had to stay up for fear the house would catch a fire if you went in and went to sleep. You forgot to pack his bag. Well, yeah, you had to pack his bag. Then you'd sit there for, oh, when they went to Chama, usually it was a, sometimes five days. We had anywhere from uh, 11 feet fall during the winter up until uh, till in the uh, winter of 31 and 32, there was 41 foot and four inches of snow fell there. And 33 and 36, some winters, 30, and 29, 28, but, uh, there was a, a few winters when there would only be 14 or 15 foot of snowfall there. Usually after we'd had a winter with real heavy snow, why we'd have a light winter. But uh, there was plenty. Deep, some places deep, the rotary plug up and you'd have to back out and let the rotary clear out. And sometimes the section men would be up there caving that place in and then go back in again. Some of those cuts is, had to hit several times to get through them. We're sitting here in the caboose with the window open and about so far out on each side is solid snow. And they'd go in when they'd stop and had to back out, they'd reach out and 
make a mark in the snow. And you may get next time you might even lose a little. You might gain an inch, you might lose an inch or something before you finally broke through. But we just kinda kept just for something to do, we'd make a mark out the window in the snow. <laughs> The rotary is a fascinating piece of machinery to watch, and in our 1991 program, rotary pilot Earl Noob answered everyone's questions on how it works. Basically, this is a steam locomotive in a box, essentially. There's a locomotive boiler here, uh, coal-fired, just like the steam locomotives. It powers two cylinders that are mounted up toward the front, which turn a bevel gear set, which turns the main shaft that turns the blade up on the front. This is where the fireman hangs out. Uh, we generally carry two of them because it sucks up a lot of coal. It's got a regular firebox door on this thing. There isn't a whole lot of fire in there right now, so we'll, we'll throw a little bit in. Burns probably in getting up the top of the hill will probably burn about probably about five to six tons of coal. This thing's hard to fire on. Uh, it steams real well. It's got a lot of firebox in here. A big grade area. And uh, the tube length is pretty short, so it drafts real well. Carries 195 pound, 190 pounds of uh, steam pressure. There's a water gauge right here. Shows about a half a glass. This is a steam gauge. Shows you how much steam pressure, so the fireman has an idea what's going on. I guess that's basically it here. Let me go up to the side over here. In here, we have, here's another water glass here, and the, the gauge cocks, and an injector for putting water in. There's two injectors, one on this side, and one on the other side, and one on this side. The one on the other side is hooked up to the rotary's tender itself. This one is hooked up to the water car that's following. So there's two separate water cars. To get up to the top of the hill, we'll probably go through about 10,000 gallons of water, somewhere around there. This is the main reservoir. There's an air compressor on the other side that pumps up air that runs the brakes on the rotary as well as runs the flanger underneath it. Uh, you notice there's an air date here from Alamosa in February of 1936. Shows some of the history here. This is the steam pressure gauge for the uh, uh, for the wheelman, as well as his air brake gauge, tells him what's going on here. This is a Johnson bar here. This controls the forward and reverse of the wheel itself, as well as the, uh, the throttle here, which uh, controls the speed of it. We have two hydrostatic lubricators uh, here and over here, and they provide oil lubrication to the cylinders and the valves, as well as the steam half of the air compressor. This here is the steam dome for the boiler, and you can see all of the, the taps off of this for running the injectors and uh, the lubricators and running the air pump and the dynamo for the lights. This is the dynamo that runs the lights on the, uh, on the rotary, the headlight as well as all the cab lights and interior lights on it. Uh, this lever right here with a rope on it is the whistle. This is the dry pipe running to the cylinders on each side. There's one over here too. These are the check valves here for the injector feed lines. Uh, it's interesting that both check valves are on the same side of the boiler on this uh, thing. This one here is the check valve for the injector on the other side and the pipe crosses over to the other side of the boiler. And this is the uh, check valve for the injector on this side. Hey, what is the check valve? The check valve is uh, keeps the the water from going back through the injector when the injector's not running. It shuts off the steam and water flow out of the boiler. So the water can go in to fill the boiler, but it can't run back out when it's not running. This is the air compressor on the rotary. This is a single stage 11 inch air compressor. It runs the air brakes on the rotary as well as the flanger that drops down between the rails. This is the pilot house up here. This is where the pilot rides to run the whole show from up here. This lever here controls the flanger, which uh, drops down between the rails behind the front truck 
and digs the ice and snow out from between the rails. When the lever is up, the flanger is all the way up. When it's down, it's dropped down between the rails. This brake valve here is the independent brake for the rotary itself. By moving it this way, it sets up the brake. This rope here rings a bell that tells the wheelman how to run the blade. Uh, two rings means go, one means stop, three means slow down. Also up here, the rotary pilot has a whistle cord that tells everybody what to do with the engines following behind, whether to slow down, speed up, stop, go backwards, whatever. This big wheel here flops the hood from one side to the other for throwing the snow from one side of the track to the other. Okay, underneath the floor here are all the inner workings of the rotary. This is the big bevel gear sets that make the, the blade move up front. Uh, there's uh, the two engine units on each side are not connected together except for through the bevel gear. They're not on a solid continuous axle in any way. Simple as it looks on the outside, by simply doing this and this, a whole bunch of neat stuff starts to happen. Grand had four narrow gauge rotaries. The Cumbres and Toltec owns rotary OM and the feature of this program, the OY. The Denver and Rio Grande Western operated trains over this line until December 6, 1968. In 1970, the states of New Mexico and Colorado purchased it from the Rio Grande to form today's Cumbres and Toltec. Rotary OY was built by the American Locomotive Company for the Denver and Rio Grande Western in 1923 and was stationed in Alamosa, Colorado and mostly plowed the east slope of Cumbres Pass, although it did run on occasion out of Chama. OY is actually a standard gauge design, but was delivered to the Rio Grande with both narrow and standard gauge trucks, but there is no record of it ever being used on the standard gauge. Its rotary blade has a diameter of 9 feet 8 and 1 half inches, and there's times that the height of the snow that it is plowing has exceeded that. In 2019, the rotary's body received much restoration work from the volunteer organization called the Friends of the Cumbres and Toltec. OY was not delivered with a tender, rather the Rio Grande supplied one from an already scrapped steam locomotive. There's also a former tank car that the Rio Grande converted for use in the rotary trains. The rotary is not self-propelled. Pushing it today are 282's number 487 and 484, which were both built in 1925 by the Baldwin Locomotive Works. These locomotives served much of the Rio Grande narrow gauge system, including here. We'll be plowing between Chama and Cumbres some 13 miles away. In those 13 miles, we'll be gaining over 2,000 feet in elevation. Towards the bottom, there's hardly any snow, 
and by the top the 484 and 487 will be pushing the rotary train uphill into several feet of snow. It's the first day of the event and we're just outside of the Chama Yard as the crews get used to running the rotary with just a few inches of snow on the ground. There will be much more as we gain elevation. In addition to this being a photography event, it's also an opportunity for those railroaders who have run previous rotary trains to pass along skills to a new generation of railroaders so hopefully the rotary can run in the future. The snow fighting trains traditionally consisted of the rotary, pushing locomotives, and several support cars for the crews, and the all-important cook car. Although the images suggest that we were by ourselves, our camera crews actually shared the event with a few close friends.
At Lobato Siding, our train passes an abandoned movie set that has been used in several Western films.
After plowing state line curve, the crew called it a day and returned to Chala. Day two of our rotary operation finds 487 pulling the OY back from the water tank prior to coupling onto the train. Our train is getting underway, but before we leave the yard, the crew and photographers have a little bit of fun.
For the first seven miles, 487 and 484 do all the work until the train gets to where yesterday's plowing ends. At Lobato, the 487 and OY separate from the rest of the train to cross Lobato Trestle by themselves. The load limit of the bridge will not permit any more weight than this.
made it to State Line Curve, and the rotary train will soon be back at work.
the crossing of Colorado Highway 17 below Coxo, the train stopped for servicing before getting underway once again.
On occasion, the rotary has to stop to clear out its chute.
Our train has rounded Coxo Curve and is now climbing towards Windy Point.
we are in sight of our destination, 10,015 foot Cumbres Pass.
Once the OY crossed Highway 17, it became apparent that there was a problem. Constant melting and freezing of snow from the highway snow plows had left solid ice on the flangeways of the road crossing, and there was no way that they could be dug out in the remaining daylight. So reluctantly, it was decided to stop here. Disappointing for sure, but it was still an incredible event. Hopefully someday the OY can once again be called to open up the railroad to show succeeding generations just how it was done.